Good evening and welcome to our Mark Bible study. I am so glad you decided to join us tonight. Let's have a word of prayer before we get started. Precious Lord, we thank you so much for your gospel, your good news, and that you call people from such a diverse set of backgrounds and circumstances. None of us is perfect, and yet somehow you use us. Mm -hmm. Lord, as we study this this evening, I pray that your spirit will be present and moving in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So last week, we talked about Jesus as Lord of the Sabbath. And he was trying to draw attention to um, the idea that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And that we get into some danger when we put traditions over mm -hmm. the principles that they're meant to protect or help. When we put the embroidery over the cloth, mm -hmm. if you get what I'm saying here. So after the whole, the whole interaction with... Um, the man with the withered hand, and he kind of sasses the Pharisees, a to be bit. honest. Just, yeah, just, a, just a tad. <laughs> um, in verse 7 of Mark chapter 3, it says, But Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea. He, he just, things got a little tense there, now he's giving some space. Mm -hmm. he, he, he knows he needs to make a point, but he's not pressing his luck. Mm -hmm. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea and Jerusalem. So far, these are all Jewish cities. Yeah. But notice the change in the list here. And Idumea, and mm. beyond the Jordan, and those from Tyre and Sidon, wow. a great multitude. Let's back up a second. These cities are Gentile cities. Yeah. Yeah. So already, Jesus has both Jewish and Gentile Followers. What he's doing is attracting people from everywhere. Yeah. A great multitude, when they heard how many things he was doing, came to him. Hmm. This is also an interesting little sentence because when they heard the things he was doing, he was a captivating teacher, all right, mm -hmm. but what drew these crowds was what he did. Yeah. The miracles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was... I, I, I've had some questions. Why did he do both healing and teaching, because people often won't listen to what you have to say until they see that you're willing to do something. Yeah. And yet they don't want you to just pray for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People do something want concrete. actual help. They um, do. You know, yes. So he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. This detail, by the way, is only in the Gospel of Mark. Um, it's a very practical thing, you know. People press too close, too long. There's a very real danger of just not being able to get out. So Jesus has a getaway boat. <laughs> it's like, love him, but don't love him to death yet. <laughs> but this also this also shows that Jesus had a sense of, you know, personal boundaries, that he that he was self-aware enough to know where it wasn't selfish to take care of a practical problem involving his person. This isn't an ego thing, this is a practical thing. No, absolutely. He's just making sure, not just that he's safe, but his disciples are safe too. Yeah. Because they also are in danger of being overwhelmed by they the are. number of people that are coming. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, when we went to Russia um, on evangelism, mm -hmm. um, we all had bodyguards, and I thought that was really a, a strange, you know, yeah. thing, you know, but when we're in that theater and there's just so many people, mm -hmm. um, it's important that when there's an altar call even, as oh, you know, yeah. they're running forward to, you know, you just don't want to be in the way of that. Uh, yeah. We want to be safe, so <clears throat> it seems strange to me some of these things that we would do, but... Um, you know, after you see, the, you know, the danger that mm -hmm. possibly could arise, you begin to understand why some of these things are important. Oh, yeah. And um, mm -hmm. getting, getting into this boat just made him safe. Yeah. For he healed many, so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, in, I don't know if it's in Mark's gospel or which one it is, but we hear the story of the woman who touched the hem of his robe mm -hmm. and was immediately healed. Mm -hmm. And... Um, 
you know, people realized that there was something special about Jesus, and they, they thought if they could just touch him, it would heal, heal mm -hmm. them. But that's a dangerous situation if you're Jesus and it's 5,000 people all trying to touch you. <laughs> The sick and the lame crawl. I don't know. I'm very visual. I just see people like crawling on the ground, you know, yeah. trying to get close so they can grab them. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. Now here, here, here's an interesting bit. Verse 11. And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. But he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. So, that's a bit of a weird detail. Um. <laughs> Can I just jump in and say, okay, I think okay. it's so weird that the Bible's telling us they were saying that, which uh -huh. means everybody heard it, but Jesus is telling them, be quiet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's too late. Everybody already heard it. But, I get it. Well, what I see as the reasoning behind this is, one, do you really want an unclean spirit to be the source of such an important piece of information? Yeah. No, you don't. It's not a trustworthy source, you know. Yeah. It, it undermines it, it. It undermines his credibility that such an untrustworthy source happens to be telling the truth for once in its life. Um, but also, he wasn't quite ready to have that information be public as it was. Definitely not. He was uh, playing a very mm -hmm. fine point where he was trying to teach in building blocks, and sometimes if you skip too far ahead. Um, without the context that leads up to it, things can go disastrously wrong. Well, you know, in foresight, looking forward into the story, mm -hmm. it really wasn't until a week before he died that he allowed people to say who he was. Yeah. You know, Hosanna to the son of David, he's mm -hmm. marching into Jerusalem. Yeah. I am the king. Today's the day. But then, within a week, he's dead. Right, so, he knew that the minute that he mm -hmm. actually endorsed the truth about himself, it would be a very fast march to the cross. And he had more stuff to say. He had more stuff to do Absolutely. before then. Yeah, so he's trying to slow it down. Yes, he's trying to pace it. Mm -hmm. Pace it. So you get the sense that the Jesus movement is growing. And this, these are exciting times. So many people are wanting to follow him. And it's time for him to maybe have a little bit more of a sophisticated sense of who the leaders of this movement are. Mm -hmm. So in verse 13, and he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed 12, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. So before I get into the list of these men, um, couple of interesting details. He went up on the mountain. From other Gospels, we know that this was very near the time that he preached the Sermon on the Mount. But Mark, Mark doesn't record it. Mark's more interested in, in what Jesus did than what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. And it's, le it's left to Matthew and Luke to record. And then John just records speeches of Jesus. Uh, he's much wordier in the Gospel of John than in the other three. Um, but it's interesting that he, he called to him those who he wanted, and they came to him. But then he appointed 12, as though this is a subsection of those he wanted. So mm -hmm. the, 12, the 12 were not his only followers. They were not his only mm -hmm. disciples. They were just his core that he invested most of his time in. Mm -hmm. And it's, this is an intriguing thing because... No matter how much of a relational superstar, no matter how many skills a person has in building good relationships, there's really only so so many people you can have close, mm. close, discipling relationships with at a time. Before the pandemic, that feels like ages ago, you might remember that we were learning about the 12 people you love, and it was all about this idea of putting focused love into... Uh, 12 people who are in your life. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like a very sensible, bite-sized way of attacking this. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we've had projects like that uh, in my previous churches, mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's a good idea to slim down mm -hmm. your list and really focus in on a few people in your life and making yeah. a difference. 
you know, investing in them, caring about them. You can't do everything. You can't reach everyone. It's, it's frequently better to figure out where you have the most impact and focus on that sometimes. Yeah, you know, I, I've moved around a lot. I've had a lot of different pas uh, pastorates, you know, and, and uh, probably thousands of people. Um, I can't be friends with all of them. No. I, I, I don't mean that in a negative way. Like, I don't it's love them or that I don't. It's physically impossible. It's just impossible. Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, I do the math. I tell that my church sometimes, okay, there's 300 of you attending. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I were to give you each five minutes, mm -hmm. okay, that's 1,500 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, there's not enough time all Sabbath morning to give every one of you just yeah. that many minutes. And yeah. I'm just trying to give them perspective because um, uh, just thinking, <laughs> there's just so many people. It's just impossible. I'm only one person. I can't do it. So Jesus yeah. couldn't give his time. He couldn't give five minutes to everybody in that thousand-person crowd. It's just impossible. No. Even he was limited. Limited, that's not a word. Even he <laughs> dealt with the limitations of a human body. And how often do we try to deny the fact that we, that we live in a human body that, by its very nature, has limitations? Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't deny it. Yeah. Why should we? So, I mean, you know, here, I, I, at least I see that he is realizing I can't minister to everybody because there's not enough of me. So mm -hmm. I need to multiply myself. Yeah. And by giving the same power he had mm -hmm. to 12 people, now he's multiplied himself. Now there's 13 healing. There's 13 yeah. preaching. Yeah. You know, him and the 12 is what I mean. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So let's take a look at these 12 men. The lists, of, the lists of the 12 disciples are worded slightly differently in each gospel, um, but there is room to see how they're all referring to the same 12 men. They just Some of them had different nicknames in different gospels, were known mm -hmm. in, different, in different ways. But let, let's take a look at these. So, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. Oh, Peter. How on earth did he manage to turn Peter into such an incredible force for his kingdom? This was an uneducated fisherman who had a temper problem and who did not think through things before he spoke much of the time. But God used him. His stories are legendary. I mean, you know, they are. some of these names we know literally nothing about oh, yeah. yet, but... You know, Peter, because he would just throw himself out there or open his mouth and say something, uh, he's a little bit more well-known. So I appreciate the fact that he was brazen and bold like that, because at least we have some connection with, yes. you know, a few of them. So, Well, I love it that the Gospels record Peter at his absolute worst, <laughs> denying Jesus three times and swearing like a sailor the night that he's in trial. But where I think Peter gets um, a bad reputation for no good reason is that he was still closer to Jesus in his moment of sin there than the ten who ran away. Because it was just him and John who were close by. Uh, because John, John's actually there to mm -hmm. record the scene. Mm -hmm. um, the other ten just fled. They just fled. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lesson in that. It's better to make mistakes close to Jesus than to just give up and run away <laughs> entirely. It's not what you want to be known for, though. I you know. know. I'm sure Peter's thinking like, oh, man, you guys are going to write all this stuff down. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Although Peter knew the gospel writers, most of them anyway, he could have possibly ask them Veto. to censor that. Sure. He could have vetoed it. He had a high position. I mean, he was he was one of the biggest movers and shakers in the early church, and he permitted the worst moment of his life to be in there. Perhaps because he knew that we needed to hear it. Which says something. I mean, just self-application. Mm -hmm. I think we do a disservice to the kingdom of God when we portray ourselves as not having made mistakes, as being perfect yeah. when we're when we're not. We're flawed. We, when we sanitize our past. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I really admired that, by the way, about your, your opening series here. Just yeah. So then we have James the son of Zebedee and John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is sons of thunder. Sounds like they have a temper problem too. Oh, they did. You have a temper problem? 
Jesus can use you. These, I believe, are also the brothers where their mother came up to him and was all like, hey, I want them to sit at your left and right in your kingdom. So they had a bit of a, of a status issue, too. Uh, My favorite story is, oh, those people, uh, get, shall we call down fire from heaven and destroy them? That's my favorite story. Just give us permission, Jesus. We'll take care of it for you. We'll burn them up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sons of thunder. But Jesus was able to use them. Got a temper problem? Jesus can use you. So then there's Andrew. I remember once, I remember once uh, doing a, a school assignment on the 12 Disciples, and I drew Andrew's name. Or else I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't remember or have noticed this, mm. because he's so, he's so quiet. Mm -hmm. Where he, ne he doesn't speak a single word in the Gospels, but where he's always appearing is bringing people to Jesus. That's right. Yeah. So are you not very verbose? Are you not a talker? Jesus can use people who aren't talkers. He's Peter's brother. Am I am I correct? Andrew is Peter's brother? That was in the commentary I read, but it's already clean yes, out of my brain. Right. <laughs> so he's in the shadow of Peter. That's the other thing. Yeah. Being Peter's brother means you're automatically in the shadow because you're big, boisterous. Yeah, I don't know which yeah. one's older. It doesn't say, but yeah. um, you get it, yes. Philip would later go on to meet the, the Ethiopian. Sure. So that's pretty neat. Bartholomew, I don't remember anything about him, sorry. Matthew would go on to write the gospel, but Matthew, Matthew, okay, so I've done a lot of thinking about the name Matthew lately because it's what my husband and I intend to name our baby. Oh, cool. And um, when we were our first, boy. yeah, yeah we, found that, we, we found that out just a few days ago Perfect. as of this, this filming. Cool. Um, so, you know, we went with Matthew because it's it's one of those names that's impossible to be teased. But a part of me was dissatisfied because I'm like, there's so many more interesting Bible names out there. Yeah, like, how about Bonerges or <laughs> Bonerges? <laughs> I just once want to see someone name their kid Nebuchadnezzar because he has a great story, but the longest, name most ever. teasable name, you know? Methuselah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then it hit me, like, duh. Levi Matthew has one of the best stories. We just talked mm -hmm. about it a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Levi Matthew was in a despised trade, looked down on by society, and Jesus called him. He probably was, was lumped in as having as as being just as corrupt as the company he kept, but Jesus saw the man beyond the position and decided that. This, this is my disciple. Mm -hmm. This tax collector, this hated tax collector, I love him. I'm going to make him my follower. Mm. And, and that's just so beautiful that Jesus saw past all of the noise in Matthew's life and used him. And then Matthew. What's, what's great about Matthew is that after his conversion, he was still, as we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, witnessing to the people that he used to keep company with. He didn't cut that off because he cared enough about them as people to not just completely vanish out of their lives. For most people, they also, Matthew of the four Gospels seems to be the source for Mark and Luke, or at least they, you know, argue that the stories are very similar. Uh, Matthew most likely probably was the first one to put into writing um, or at least it's debatable, but, uh, <laughs> I've always heard it was Mark, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the fact that Matthew would sit down and write out the gospel for us to be able to mm -hmm. share the story, um, his impact is huge. We, you know, we don't realize the impact. He was educated, obviously. Yeah. Um, uh, he had to be, to be a tax collector. Yeah. He had to know his numbers on a level that the, mm -hmm. that the public generally didn't. This is a part of why they were mistrusted. He had Absolutely. to be literate for his job, but most people weren't. Weren't, yeah. Yeah. So, moving on from Matthew, Thomas. Thomas mm. used to be my favorite. Okay. <laughs> he used to be? What he happened? used to be my favorite. <laughs> well, you, 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 you connect with different Bible characters during different faith struggles of your life. Where Thomas used to speak to me is that um, he gets so much of a bad reputation for being doubting Thomas. Oh, I will not believe it until I see... Mm -hmm. Until I see the, 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 the scars in his hands and his feet and his side. Put the finger in. I he demands put my evidence. In there. <laughs> he demands proof. And he, 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 gets, he gets 
so told off by preachers nowadays for, for wanting evidence, for wanting proof. In other faith traditions, he's not known as Doubting Thomas. He's known as Thomas the Confessor. Because as soon as he actually has a chance to see Jesus, his immediate reaction is, my Lord and my God. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that Jesus expects us, faith has a role in things, but we're not expected to turn our brains off. Mm -hmm. And he's okay with it if we have a need for just a little more evidence. Mm -hmm. Everyone is built in different ways. And some people just hook, line, and sinker will come to Jesus on emotional reasons alone. Um, and that's beautiful if that's you. But there are some people who need their intellect convinced mm -hmm. along with their heart. And there's no shame in that. Just make sure you're not putting up, you know, unnecessary roadblocks to faith. <laughs> <laughs> the minute Thomas actually, actually had his evidence, he was there, my Lord and my God. So then we have James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite. Sorry, I don't know much about those three. And Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And they went to a house. So Judas Iscariot. I've heard some say that, that Jesus did not choose Judas. But I don't see evidence for this here. He appointed 12. He appointed 12, and Judas is in that list. Mm -hmm. And within the body of this list, it says, who also betrayed him. Mm -hmm. Jesus knew men's hearts. Yeah. Jesus knew that Judas had the potential to do this. Mm -hmm. Perhaps he did not have a 100% clear prophetic vision at the time that Judas would do everything he would go on to do, but he knew that Judas had tendencies that could lead in that direction. But Jesus chose him anyway. And I think there's a solemn warning in that. Mm. There's a warning in that. Both a warning and a blessing. Just because Jesus chooses you for a task doesn't mean you can't fall. But... It also means that even if there is darkness in your heart, he can still use you for a time. Mm -hmm. Even if you have the potential to do a terrible thing, he can still use you. But for the three years of Jesus' public ministry, Judas was a part of it. Mm -hmm. It's an uncomfortable truth, but the entire time the disciples were out doing miracles and and um, casting out demons, Judas was among them. I would love an unbiased record of verse 19 where they don't know the end. Yes! What would Ju who would Judas Iscariot be if they didn't know that at the end he's going to betray Jesus? I mean, Judas Iscariot, the, the money counter, or you know what I'm saying, or the, the, mm -hmm. the treasurer, or Judas Iscariot, the... You know, the Joker, maybe he was funny, maybe, you know, I don't know, the serious one, or whatever his title would have been. It's just that the end of the story is biased at the beginning. It is. And I've really got to hand it to the gospel writers for showing in their accounts of the Last Supper, Jesus' final attempts to reach Judas, mm -hmm. even as he knew he was going to do it. Mm. There, there are moments in the Last Supper and some of the accounts where Jesus says, what you're going to do, do it quickly. Showing Judas that he knew what he was about. Um, the fact that he washed Judas' feet alongside the rest. That Judas was a part of that first communion. Mm. Such an intimate moment. And Jesus extended that grace to Judas, even though at the moment he was actively plotting to betray Jesus. Hmm. I've always thought that, not always, but I've done a lot of thinking about Judas's story and how it's told in conjunction with Peter's, that Judas could have been saved even after betraying Jesus to his death mm -hmm. if only he hadn't given up and pulled the plug the night he did it. If he could have just somehow held on 
for another two days and seen how the story would continue to unfold, he could have been saved. There could have been a future for him. He could have been, he could have been greater than Peter because can you imagine Peter has this turnaround from merely verbally betraying Jesus for Judas to be redeemed and go on to tell his story mm -hmm. would have been incredible. Powerful. Absolutely. But instead, he chose to end it. Mm. There are a great many reasons why people choose to end it. Um, and I'm not going to get into all of that because that would be a 10 minute digression and we're already over time. <laughs> but if you are currently struggling with this issue, I want to encourage you to hang on. Mm -hmm. If only because you don't know what even is going to happen in the next three days that could change your life for the better. Mm -hmm. If Judas had just hung on for three stinking days, mm -hmm. what would have changed? How much potential could have been released in him? Mm -hmm. Don't give up. So all of these disciples, imperfect, messed up, frequently uneducated, temper-laden, doubting, what a team. sinful men were Jesus' team. And if he could use them, he can use you. Let's pray. Precious Lord, I thank you so much that you use us. That messed up, sinful as we are, you use us. Mm -hmm. I pray, Lord, that we will accept this challenge with joy. And that we will lean on you always in doing it. Lord God... Make us faithful in responding to the call you have on our lives. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen.